All right, so this is a suggestion here. Um, could the U.S. defend from an invasion of the homeland? Um, it's such a great question that I almost had to do this, guys, because I don't know. Um, I think that we're pretty good on the east and west coast. Our Navy is pretty much solid, right? Um, if anything, it would have to come from the north or above, in a sense, right? Like, it would maybe, yeah, the north, the northern border or the southern border, if anything, right? Um, but you'd also, but we would know that it's coming because they would have already invaded Canada or Mexico. You get what I'm saying? We would know that. It's pretty obvious. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the only thing that I can think of. Um, that would probably be a weak point in a sense, right? Um, but I think pretty much um, they're not really, like I said, unless they are above, as in like uh, in the sky, potentially. Maybe. I don't know. But let's see. We'll, we'll check it out. Hey, listen, if you are new here, please like and subscribe. The more that you like this content, the more that I know that you specifically would like to see more of this specific type of content, okay? Let's go ahead and jump into this immediately, guys. Let's go ahead and check this out. Let's get this uh, question answered. It's the early 1980s, okay. and over the sky of the American heartland, Soviet and Cuban paratroopers begin to fall from the sky. In minutes, thousands of communist invaders have gained a foothold in the very heart of America. With World War III in full swing, it's up to a band of plucky... Oh, this is hypothetical, obviously. I'm like, wait a second, when did this happen? Very heart of America. <laughs> With World War III in full swing, it's up to a band of plucky teenagers to fight a guerrilla war against the godless commies. If you grew up in the 80s or just plain don't have bad taste in movies, then you're well aware of the action hit Red Dawn, a film that portrays a Soviet invasion of the United States toward the end of the Cold War. No, yeah, we're not I, talking I never about saw the remake. Movie, we don't speak of the remake. I never but saw this film right. aside, could it really happen? That question was asked by infographic show fan Blazik, who wanted to know if someone were to invade America, could the U.S. pull all its forces home and hold out against a foreign invader? Despite what fiction like Red Dawn would have you believe, the United States was never in any danger of an invasion by the Soviet Union, mostly because the Russian people were about as interested in invading the U.S. as Americans were in invading the Soviet Union. Of course, that didn't stop politicians and military officials on both sides using the fear of an evil capitalist or communist invasion from ballooning defense budgets. The saddest fact of the Cold War just might be that despite all the preparations to defend oh. from an invasion by both sides. I was like, wait, what's going on here? Neither NATO nor the Soviet by all the preparations to defend from an invasion by both sides, neither NATO nor the Soviet bloc ever had a single war plan drawn up for an actual preemptive invasion of the other's territory. But another major reason why the U.S. was never under any threat of an invasion is due to its unique place in the world geography. In order for an enemy to get to America, first it must cross two massive oceans. And this geographic fact makes the United States the single most secure nation on Earth. Yeah, we would definitely see that shit coming, bro. Even today, moving troops and equipment across the oceans is a massive undertaking in terms of both logistics and cost, and very few nations are even capable of attempting the feat. But let's say that the two leading peer competitors to the U.S. decided to join forces and team up against the United States. With oh. all troops returned home from overseas, could right. the U.S. defend itself against a double-sided assault against it by China and Russia? First, the two-power alliance would have to decide on where to strike. For an invasion to be successful, both nations would have to land troops as quickly as possible, and that would require the use of a working seaport. These ports would require good rail and road infrastructure, and must have deep water anchorages so that large cargo ships could dock and disgorge troops and heavy equipment. The need to take and hold major seaports is critical, as aside from a few token forces with a small number of fire support platforms, amphibious landings alone wouldn't be able to deliver yeah, I think um, what on the East Coast is Norfolk, right? Something like that. I think maybe Norfolk. Um, no, that's not happening, bro. Norfolk is super secure, bro. Firepower fast enough to secure a beachhead. In Normandy during World War II, the success of the landings was largely down to a brilliant deception played out by the Allies, which saw the Nazis concentrate their forces at the wrong landing site. And even when the real landings happened a hundred miles away, Nazi commanders were so fooled by Allied intelligence that they ordered their forces to hold their positions, believing that the real assault was coming their way any day. The ruse, combined with some whopping tactical blunders by Hitler, allowed the Allies to quickly build a makeshift port facility which let Allied armor and artillery disembark. 
Had Hitler allowed his commanders to commit panzer reinforcements to the landings, Normandy would have likely ended as a complete catastrophe for the Allies. By the time he cleared reserve panzer units for the assault on the beachheads, Allied logistical units had already disembarked enough tanks to repel the assault. In an invasion of the U.S. homeland, such a ruse would be impossible to pull off. Long-range and satellite surveillance assets yeah. would see an invasion fleet days before it made landfall. And, it and that's kind of why I'm like, I don't know, guys. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing to sit and have a, a conversation about. But like, the only way I can think of it would legitimately coming from, it would be from Mexico. But they'd have to invade Mexico first, right? Or they have to invade Canada first, and we would know way before you get what i'm saying all that all that movement we would know we would see that should have like miles away days away literally its target would be clearly known to the american defenders therefore china and russia would have to act quickly and decisively taking major seaports and holding them long enough to disembark a sizable expeditionary force able to repel american counter assaults for China, the only good options for unloading main battle tanks and mechanized artillery would be the ports in LA, Long Beach, Oakland, Tacoma, and Seattle. The LA Long Beach complex would be especially attractive as it's one of the world's largest ports and would allow Chinese forces to disembark yeah. very quickly. Unfortunately, these port facilities are also very close to several American air and naval bases, making them easily defended. The Seattle and Tacoma ports, however, are far more vulnerable as only five major American bases are near these facilities. Landing in Washington, though, would mean Chinese forces would have to fight south and into California through easily defended and very mountainous <laughs> terrain, a tactical nightmare for any Chinese commander. Russian invaders would face an even less enviable mm -hmm. job. The American East Coast is home to far more numerous large port facilities, giving the Russian invasion force a greater number of targets to pick from. Unfortunately, the yeah, American happen, East Coast bro. is also the most heavily defended, that's with not several happen, dozen bro. major military installations spread out from north to south. The East Coast is also home to America's largest military shipyards, which would be so heavily protected it would be suicidal to attempt a landing or assault against them. Russia's best bet would be to attempt a landing in Mobile, Alabama oh, or in Houston, Gulf. Texas. This, however, would mean Russian forces would have to spend more time out at sea. <clears throat> and yeah, but we'd see them coming, like beneath, like through the keys. That they'd have, to, they'd have to literally go through, the, from between the keys and Cuba. We'd, we'd see all of that. You, you understand? You're not gonna get that close into our damn waters and with all of that shit and think that you're gonna make it. Don't do that, obviously. Move into the Gulf of Mexico, where they would be surrounded on all sides but the south by major American air bases. That's, for that's both our challengers, the tactical picture is mm -hmm. not looking very good, as the United States simply has no viable landing sites for a major expeditionary force that couldn't be easily defended. China and Russia could opt to coerce or bribe Mexico or Canada into allowing them to land at their facilities yeah. and launch an invasion into the U.S. itself. It's the only this option. would be by far the best strategic option for the invasion forces, but in response to the agreement between either nation and the Sino-Russian alliance, the United States would immediately begin a large-scale bombing campaign against port facilities in Canada or Mexico, with every viable port being within easy reach of American bombers. Even before the invasion force crossed the ocean, they would be sailing for ports that have been turned into rubble. Assuming that the U.S. didn't use naval aviation, which it definitely would, the invaders yep. could opt for using ports in South America, well out of reach of most American bombers, and then simply move north to invade through Mexico. Moving through South America's poor rail and road infrastructure, though, would be a nightmare for the invaders, allowing plenty of time for the U.S. to simply move blocking forces through Mexico to Panama and then hold off the invasion there. If, miraculously, though the Alliance did manage to land forces in Canada or Mexico, it would face a different tactical nightmare altogether. In Canada, the lack of suitable border crossings would force the invaders to spread out over a large area, or bottleneck and be subjected to endless attacks by American air power. In Mexico, military border crossings would be possible over a far larger area, but enemy forces would be moving through terrain that provided absolutely no cover. American air power would once yeah. more devastate any invaders trying to move through the flat terrain of the U.S.-Mexico border. Geography alone provides the United States with near invulnerability from enemy invasion, but the logistics of the world's militaries proves why the U.S. simply cannot be invaded. An invasion of the American homeland would rely on naval power to get the job done. And right off the bat, no nation on Earth, nor any combination of nations, has the firepower and logistical support needed to carry out such an invasion. The matter... Well, to my knowledge, I think China's, um, China's Navy is pretty strong. 
Um, but I still don't think that it, it's it's stronger than ours. But I but I'm pretty sure that China's navy is absolutely powerful. Um, that is definitely not anything to kind of sleep on. You get what I'm saying here? Uh, definitely not. But I don't. But I definitely, for a fact, don't think that their navy is stronger than ours. I'm sure you guys will let me know in the comments. Let's go. There is one of historical necessity for the world. Ever since the end of the Second World War, all the world's major powers have had no need to project military power far from their own shores, except for the United States. The Soviet Union was chiefly concerned with securing its European borders, and in the case of a third world war, its most vital strategic objectives could all be reached over land. That just made the me vitally dizzy, yeah. important oil fields of the Middle East could Slightly. all be taken via land routes through Afghanistan and Iran, and no navy was needed to hold off NATO forces in Europe. The same right. was true for Europe's NATO members. While once their mighty navies ruled the waves all over the world, their concerns in the 20th century quickly became resisting a possible Soviet invasion, and for that, no major naval power was needed needed. In the Atlantic, the Soviets hoped to slow the American response with the use of submarines, but ultimately knew that they could never stop the U.S. Navy and thus never seriously tried. On the other side of the world, China struggles to turn itself into a first world power, and other than resentment towards Japan over its actions in World War II, China has had no real motivations to build a strong navy, at least until now. Much like the Soviet Union and Europe's NATO partners, though, China definitely had no real reason to build a heavy sea lift capability in order to move thousands of troops and heavy equipment across the ocean. On the other hand, the United States is both blessed and cursed by geography. While it's untouchable to invasion thanks to the Atlantic and the Pacific, it also means that in order to project power on the world stage, America has always needed a strong navy. This is the reason that the US has always had a very strong naval tradition, and why it has invested in naval and air transport more than any other nation on Earth. If US troops want to get somewhere after all, they're certainly not walking there. Right. To even get forces into the U.S., any invading army is going to need some serious sea lift capability, and no force on Earth comes even close to the U.S.'s 125-vessel Military Sea Lift Command, which operates a vast fleet of oilers, tankers, and heavy cargo transports. Yet, even this fleet is not enough according to some analysts, and plans are being called for that include dramatically increasing the capability of the U.S.'s military transport fleets. China has in recent years expanded its landing ship capabilities, with several dozen available to carry troops and heavy equipment. These ships, though, are not meant for global operations and are only designed for cross-strait invasions into Taiwan or to ferry supplies to China's illegal holdings and the artificial islands it built across the South China Sea. A crippling land Artificial islands? Uh, sounds like I need to do some research. That's, that's interesting. Artificial islands. Lack of support vessels such as oilers means that China cannot physically get its landing ships across the Pacific, though even if this problem were to be solved, the nation cannot hope to make a contested landing on foreign soil. Again, this is because of China's lack of need for a global expeditionary military force. China's chief military concerns lie with a military invasion and forced repatriation of Taiwan, and thus it has not invested money into developing a true blue water navy. Russia has the forced repatriation? Uh, that sounds scary. Even less naval transport capability and support vessels. Would you Can you imagine if the United States was was forced to repatriate to the to the British Empire? That's that's what that sounds like when I hear <laughs> again is a result of its military objectives being close to home. To compound the two nation sea lift problems, both nations have no dedicated amphibious assault ships capable of providing close air support and air superiority to landing forces on a contested beach. By comparison, the U.S. operates nine of these specialized vehicles, and they will soon be equipped with the F-35 stealth fighter. Projecting air power is in fact the biggest weakness for any nation hoping to invade the U.S., and China and Russia combined only operate two active duty aircraft carriers of extremely limited capabilities. Russia's infamous Admiral Kuznetsov very publicly had to be towed back to a friendly port after experiencing severe mechanical problems. Without adequate air power, neither nation could expect to secure a foothold on the U.S. mainland. America's air forces are twice as large as both nations combined, and its naval aviation alone is as large as Russia's total air power. If by some miracle either nation could get troops across the ocean to U.S. shores, the lack okay. of air power would reduce the attempted landings to a suicide mission. In the end, not only could the U.S. protect from an invasion of the homeland, but it is currently and for the foreseeable future completely invulnerable to military invasion. Luckily, the U.S., China, and Russia have no desire to fight each other, and there exists no real reason to. 
Now that you've made it to the end of the video, why not keep learning about? Wow. Okay. Um. Yeah. So uh, kind of as I expected. I mean, the only way, like logically, but I mean, they did kind of point out some of the Gulf of Mexico thing. You know, um, Houston and Alabama. That was interesting. I didn't put that into uh, my thoughts here. But um, yeah. There's there's no actual invasion to be worried about right um just because of how secure i think we kind of are on the east coast and on the west coast um mainly the east coast hopefully they know better than to go to uh virginia stay away from virginia <laughs> all right um listen um let me know in the comments um if you want me to do any more of this type of content i have no problem with it guys and um i will get to it as soon as i possibly can all right and uh, listen uh you guys all have an amazing day and enjoy it thoroughly all right